Hello, everyone, everywhere. This is Pastor Robert Thibodeau. Welcome to your Freedom Through Faith video minute for today, which is May 26th. Now, we've been studying the past few days from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And we made it up uh, about halfway, but we'll actually, I think we'll be able to finish tomorrow, uh, if not the day after. But to save the time, go back and watch the past three days of these episodes if you missed them, because it will build the case for what we're, we're going to end up at probably tomorrow. Uh, but you need that foundation to understand what we're about to say. Now, in verse 8 is where I want to focus on today. I'll actually go up to verse 7. But God, or Jesus, made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, verse 8 tells us that Jesus, being fully God, humbled himself and became a man with all of our limitations. And in his earthly ministry, he demonstrated uh, what and how a man would have had to live in order to fulfill all the commandments of the law. In his teachings, he demonstrated he could fulfill the law and the prophets. And then he chastised the Jewish leadership because at a minimum, they should have recognized him from the scriptures for who he was, the Messiah from God. And he even berated them and put, for putting more emphasis on the do nots uh, that became, or the do's, in other words, the commandments, that became burdens for the people to carry, while at the same time making provision or exceptions for themselves so they wouldn't have to do any of the things they're telling the people to do. And it kind of sounds like Congress today, doesn't it? Anyway, I get back on topic. Amen. Uh, Jesus, being fully God, emptied himself of his divine rights, but retained all of the power of God, which is why, you know, he could cast demons out, uh, you know, people were healed, people were restored, made whole, but by emptying himself, he was, in fact, doing the will of God, amen? Now, uh, for the first appearance of Jesus when he, you know, when he was in this earth during the New Testament times, uh, God him, this was fulfilling God himself fulfilling his promise to Abraham and Abraham's seed, Abraham's descendants, of which we can claim we've been grafted in to that olive tree, amen, that since Abraham was willing to give God his son, without question, without reservation, just, God, you, you asked me to do this, I'm willing to do it because I know you are God, amen? And since Abraham was willing to do that, to give him his firstborn son, despite the temptation to say no, God would therefore give his son, even though Jesus at any time could have said no. Remember when Jesus chastised his disciples and told them, don't you realize I can call down 12 legions of angels right now? They come and rescue me. But if I did that, <laughs> you all are lost. You know, he says, but we're doing this to fulfill God's will. It's his will, not my will. But his will is now God's will. Amen? Now, Jesus humbled himself to do God's will, all the way to accepting death on the cross. Nobody could take his life from him. Remember when he said, no man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself? I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I've received from my Father. Now, notice what he just said. Let's dissect that verse. Part one, nobody can take my life from me. I mean, that goes right along with what we just said, right? Now, part two, I lay it down of myself. That goes to the point that he was fulfilling the will of God by laying his life down as a ransom payment for mankind. And part three, and I have the power to take it up again. Glory to God. Amen. He was not hoping God would raise him up again and back to life. He had the promise from God that it would be so. In Psalm 16:10, we read, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or hell, neither will allow your Holy One to experience corruption, or a better translation will read, neither would you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You know, Jewish custom was that if a person died, that spirit hung around the corpse for three days, and the fourth day would depart the wherever it was he was going to go. 
Uh, this is one of the reasons why Jesus was raised the third day. But the point I want you to see here is the promise from God in Psalm 16. I mean, Jesus picked up on that as he was studying the scriptures, that Jesus would be raised from the dead. I mean, there are other scriptures we could talk about as well, but this is the main one uh, talking about the resurrection that everybody points to. Jesus would have known about this promise as a rabbi who was trained in the scriptures. So we see Jesus willingly laying his life down and fully expecting to be raised up again. Amen? Now, another point I want to make, Jesus told his disciples, nobody can take my life from me. Nobody. I lay it down of my own accord, of my own decision. It is his decision to lay it down. Now, I want to demonstrate an idea here. I can't do it on here, but picture this in your mind. Think about you are holding on to a rope. You have it in your hands, and someone is trying to pull it from you. And you loop it around your hand, and you're holding on, and they're tugging and tugging and tugging, but they can't get it out of your hand, right, until you release your grip. And then they'll take possession of the rope, correct? Now, think about the spirit of Jesus. He has it in this body. He is fully God. He's contained in this flesh shell, fully man. Because a living man will, the, the definition of man is a walking, speaking spirit, Adam. Okay, a walking, speaking spirit. Jesus is the fulfillment. He's the second, called the second Adam in some places. So he is identical to what Adam would have been as far as God's spirit dwelling in this flesh and blood body. So Jesus is making the decision to lay his life down. He contains, he has this life in him, but he willingly lays it down, just like letting go of that rope. And then Satan possesses that spirit, okay? And Satan thought, if Jesus is fully God and fully man, he's the Messiah, I defeat him, I defeat God. And he could take Jesus' spirit down to the, the extreme, the bottommost depths of hell, thinking, I got him, I'm locking him up down the deepest dungeon forever. I'm locking God up. He threatened to lock me up. I'm going to lock him up. Ah, uh, but that fell right into the plan of God. Amen. But I want you to see that you have this same power. If you already possess something, it's yours. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It's yours. Nobody can take it from you, at least not easily. But if you give it to them, then you are basically sowing it into their life. Which means the minute you do that, it has just become seed. And the Bible tells us, and we're not going to these scriptures today, that you can expect a return on the seed you sow. And I'm not talking about finances specifically, but the point I'm trying to make is nobody can take something from you if you already possess it. Amen? Until you make the decision to let it go and turn it into seed. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Remember when he said, you know, he told the Father, he says, Father, into your hands now, I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. He hung his head and gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. And Satan snatched it and took it to hell. Now, your healing, your health, has already been guaranteed to you by the word of God. Amen. Well, Brother Bob, how come I'm still sick? Matter of fact, why are you still limping around, Brother Bob, from your accident? Well, because, no, no, follow this closely now. It's not because you lacked faith. It's not because God doesn't love you. It's not because he's trying to humble you. It's not because he expects you to, to you know, bear up underneath this burden. What he's doing, he's trusting you. Trusting you to do his will, to bear it through the process of which we are not usually privy to see, but through the process, somebody else will come to know Jesus by watching you go through whatever it is you're going through and listening to you to praise him. And even in the midst of your trouble, keep singing praises to him, trusting him, healing, health, finances, whatever the case may be. So keep your testimony focused on Jesus, amen, and what he has already given to you. Find it in the scriptures. Say, Lord, this was given to me.
I have your promises. And if you don't see it, say, Lord, I'm going to release this and just trust you to work it all out in the end. Amen. Keep your praises on him. You don't know who's watching you and how that will affect their eternal destiny. That's what God wants you to do. You may, may not be called to go to the far-flung reaches of the world and preach the gospel in 10,000 member tent meetings and all this other stuff, but you have a testimony to share. Your testimony, what comes off your lips is your testimony. What are you saying today? What are you sowing into the hearts of other people? Despite what you may be going through health-wise, financial-wise, whatever the case may be, what is coming off your lips is what you're sowing into other people. Is it complaining about God, what he hasn't done for you, anything? How's that going to affect their eternal destiny? When you just keep praising God and all this, you're sowing whatever the devil is trying to keep from you. You're sowing what you have into the life of the other person through your praise. Amen. And when you do that, you have just become heir of an abundant harvest. You may not see it this side of heaven, but I can guarantee when you get to the other side of heaven, oh, you're going to be so blessed in all that you do.